So we are here tonight. I am really looking forward to this chat with the lovely, lovely Bryce Watson from Esoteric Atlanta and the equally gorgeous Cindy. Um, now, Cindy, this is the first time that we've sort of spoken properly. So before we start, can you both introduce, we'll start with Cindy, just to introduce yourself to the listeners, because you are fascinating with your range of skills. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, so, well, I'm Cindy, obviously, and I'm owner of Sacred Garden Yoga in Marietta, Georgia. I've owned it um, November, which is right around the corner, will be 18 years that I've had the business open. So I've been running that brick and mortar location and not so much in this this uh, YouTube realm. Is, it's fairly new to me because I'm used to just like being with people in my, in my little container of sacred garden yoga. But then I started to feel this need, this urge to spread more, you know, to like spread and share the, the minute, what I feel is like a ministry almost to share it more with other people, which uh, drew me out of my little container, my safe little, my safe little corner in Marietta, <laughs> and bringing it out into the vastness of, of the rest of the world. But um, yes, yeah, so, so my experience, I started out with it's, it's funny, because I kind of went backwards as far as how I got into this kind of work. Um, uh, my first first certification was as a hypnotherapist. And it was in my early 20s, which is kind of weird because usually people will go into the realm of yoga or something like that before going into the realm of, of hypnotherapy. And the, the teacher that I studied with, he's passed away now, but his name was Dr. Charles Skillis. And, you know, of course, he taught us all about the, the um, how to work with the, the mind and with the hypnotherapy and dropping into the subconscious. But he also taught me how to do uh, spirit release work. In other words, releasing entities and things like that off of beings. That was like my first introduction into the esoteric realm was doing spirit release work, which was like, whoa, <laughs> at that time, I didn't even, even think about it. Um, I had been practicing yoga, but then my yoga teacher training came after that. And then after yoga teacher training, I went through a lot of uh, like Reiki Reiki one, Reiki two, Reiki three, a lot, a lot of just refining the, um, the energetic skills, you know, working with energy. I worked with, I'm from Peru. Uh, um, I moved here when I was about four or five years old. And then I got into the shamanic arts as well through the in Indian tradition. And the work that I do now is just this culmination and combination of all these different these different things coming together and um it's it's hard to describe what i do i think but i but any energy healer will tell you that any energy healer will be like oh, man i can't describe what i do <laughs> because it, it is hard but you know of course i still teach yoga i teach uh, uh, classes and workshops on like developing intuitive skills and those intuitive arts i pass reiki to them you know i do all that stuff i consider sacred garden yoga not just to be a yoga studio anymore but almost like a mystery school where we delve into to all these realms. And I've always loved the sacred feminine. She has been in and out throughout the whole entire, my whole entire experience um, since the get go. So that's just a little about my, like my background and my history and all this. That is pretty impressive. And this is gonna be perfect for tonight's conversation. Now, Bryce, the amazing Bryce from Esoteric Adanta, who I think everyone sort of knows you and, and Anyone who's watching this on my channel, because it would be on both our channels, please go across to Esoteric Atlanta because Cindy and Bryce have done some really wonderful chats on there on, on all sorts of different subjects. But just tell us a bit about how did you two meet, Bryce? Well, I will say before that, Cindy has actually opened up her, you reopened up her YouTube channel too. Oh, so she you. has a... She's just now building it back again. So yeah, and, and I'll put and same for people watching for my channel. Go, I put Catherine's link down in the description box. Go over. We work with. That's one thing beautiful about this jumping into this new timeline is I feel like we're all over the world just working together. You know, it's been just a beautiful thing. And um, well, back to the question. I met Cindy. God, how long has it been? Like seven, eight years now, Cindy. I'd have to go back and I look. think so. Maybe At least that because I remember you. I met you when you came back from India. I don't yeah. know if it was your first time from India, but I know when you came back, 
you were going through some like transitions yes. in your life and a lot I of, have to go a lot of like movement. <laughs> I feel like I've known you my whole life anyway. So I always tell people on my channel, like all of us that work together on Zoom, I feel like I know everybody in person, but we've only ever met each other on Zoom. But Cindy is someone I know in my real life. I see her every week. Um, I teach at her yoga school on Sunday mornings. Um, that's my favorite class to teach. It's a bunch of badass women. For the most part, a couple of guys will come, but mostly it's these badass women that will get up early on a Sunday morning and will come and do one of the hardest forms of yoga that there is. So I always say that's like my favorite class because talk about the divine feminine. Those women are super powerful but um that's how i met cindy was through through our yoga schools um and cindy knows my my boyfriend and you know atlanta is a big city but it's also a small town too and where cindy is located in marietta marietta is like a suburb of the city so i live right in the middle of atlanta it takes me what 20 minutes to drive to marietta so it's all interconnected and um cindy's done work on me before in person she's done her reiki and her shamanic stuff and it's it's really powerful the work that she can do and she does it privately with you when you do a book a session so it's not like people are watching you it's it's a private thing with cindy so although that'd be kind of interesting to watch somebody go through one of those but um and she also does big workshops as well so we met through yoga um and we've continued just to keep working together even now on youtube it's evolved over from classroom to youtube too so yes and i've learned so much from bryce teaching classes so much about ashtanga and just through our conversations you know we've uh i've, I've learned so much from from you as well so oh. yeah catherine when this is all over you'll have to come visit because after my class oh, on Friday, when all, when all the like regular when people leave and there's only a couple of us left we start talking about the weirdest stuff We'll talk about like <laughs> aliens. <laughs> and they oh, I know. Walk in, they'd be like, what is this? What are y'all talking about? So it's it's quite fun. Yeah, that's what's weird. Uh, you'll have to join us, Catherine, when we're here. I will be. I will be. I'll be coming over. Don't you worry. And these connections are so, so priceless, aren't they? And Bryce and I were talking about on a couple of the other chats that we've had about it's so special about how people are coming together, supporting each other. And we're realizing that there are lots of us out there that think like this. So today we really wanted to have a chat, something I haven't really spoken to about with anyone else on my channel, about this really interesting phenomena of we've got one camp of people that might call themselves truthers or awake or these, all these awful labels that we get put on us. There's a lot worse than that as well. And we think that we're seeing the situation from one situation and we think we know what we're going on. And then, then we've got another big camp of people that we might call the non-awake, but they think that we're the mad ones and they think they know of things going on. And one thing that's been really apparent throughout this journey for me is the level of mind control that we've all been under for so long and we're waking up to it, but I, I don't know myself whether what mind control I'm still under. You know, yeah. it's, it's very fascinating, isn't it? So I just wanted to have a good old girls chat about it. And, you know, Cindy, just really get your perspective on it as well as Bryce's in terms of why this is happening, how it's happening, and whether it can give us some different tools in our tool belt, because what we've all been noticing is it's almost like the divide between the camps is getting bigger. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I was just mulling it over over a glass of wine the other night, and I was thinking, we've got to try something different. You know, the definition of insanity is keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. And we're getting stronger and stronger in our community, but we're also being more and more ostracized um, mm -hmm. deliberately often by the propaganda that's put out. So I was thinking we need to explore different ways of bridging that gap. You know, it's interesting because I was talking about this. Sorry, if y'all hear my dog barking. There's a squish. Real life here. Um, um, there's, um, I was speaking about this with a couple of my girlfriends last night who were on this journey as well. And um, we were talking about even people within our camp, if you want to call it that, that see basically the same thing we see with the facade the pantomime that's going on but yet there are people even within our camps that are a little what i feel like a little bit more delirious than if that makes sense like they see yeah. things in a different way too then maybe my approach is more grounded and more like eh, i don't know if that's actually true you know so it's even within these two camps there's like shades of understanding you know and even um within like 
a lot of what I do. Sorry about that, guys. See, my dog is. We have a, we have a plumber here right now, so my dog thinks his a friend has come to play. So, <laughs> um, um, you know, I even like part of what I've been doing and what Cindy has helped me with a lot is breaking down um, the deception of religion. And my background is in the Cindy's as well, and probably yours too, Catherine. Is is Christianity. And even looking at where there's been deception there. And I've even noticed within the, our community that people aren't even willing to look at the, they just want to, they don't want to look at this. So it's like, there's all your, there's just different layers of, of illusion as the yoga sutras called Maya illusion that we're all. And I know I was saying with my friends last night, I know there are things that I'm still probably wrong on that. Cause I'm just so, my brain's been so just, you know, does that make sense? What I'm saying? Like, like we don't know everything. And I know there's going to be things that are, that I'm still brainwashed on that are probably not accurate you know what i'm saying like you know i know and but cindy you talked about because for those who are on telegram cindy was our guest on monday night for the divine feminine and something cindy spoke about with the divine feminine was that was the power of intuition and when you take away the divine feminine you take away someone's sovereignty so i thought that was great for the con the context of mind control and how even the beginning of mind control can happen if you take away someone's sovereignty. So do you want to elaborate a little bit on that, Cindy, for those who missed that? Because the way you said it was gorgeous and beautiful. Yeah, well, you know, and, and just to back on what you're saying, Bryce, is that, yes, these ideas of delusions can exist anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can exist within, it, you know, it exists even within the yoga community. It mm -hmm. exists within any kind of spiritual community where you think that you're, you're rising above it. But this is why it's also so important to do your own internal work because the ego can seep into anything. So you might think you're doing all this, you know, this great, wonderful stuff. And then suddenly you get caught up in, in a narrative and you don't even know how you got there. And then you realize, well, well, wait a minute, this isn't right. You know, because there's a lot of like cult stuff sometimes that can happen even within the yoga community, within spiritual communities. And they say that they're doing it for the, the highest and best of all. But then are they really or did they, you know, the leaders of that, did they just get caught up in their own ego and then just it, it, it can sneak up on you, like this sense or this desire for power. Right. And if they're and, and then going back to your um, the idea of intuition. Yes. If you quit believing and trusting in yourself, which to me, that's a, a big thing about intuition. It's just learning to listen and, and to trust in yourself, just to trust in your gut instinct, to trust in your ability to be able to see and hear and sense beyond uh, what what's ordinary. I mean, that all feeds it into your intuition. And if that's taken away from you, then um, it's, it's so much more easier for you to be manipulated mm -hmm. because then you get caught up into fear and, and the whole mind control thing, at least the way I see it, it's, it's feeding on people's fear, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so, and, and there's a lot of fearful people. And, and just in general, we, we all go through our lives when we get caught up in fear. I mean, not, you know, take away the, the, all this stuff that's going on, you know, just everyday living, <laughs> We get caught up in, in fear of, of whatever, you know, whatever that we're going through. And when you're in fear and you just, you forget, like you forget that you have the wisdom and knowledge inside of you, you're going to start looking outside of yourself. And if you look outside um, to, in, in your discernment, like, because it's, you know, it's really important right now to, to use good discernment. You know, rationality is a good thing. Thinking things through discernment, you know, that's a good thing. But when you're in fear, and this is a true like psychological, biological thing, if your fight or flight response mode is on, you, you, you can't think straight. Your discernment is, is, um, is, is not as strong as it should be. Right. Okay. So then your discernment is down and you hear people talking about stuff. It's easy to get caught up in whatever they're their teachings or what, whatever their narrative is. And then you fall for it. And before you know it, you're, you're brainwashed too. You know what I mean? So it's like you take away that, um, that intuition. And, it, and if you think about that too, even as you grow up, like how often is your intuition really fed? Like if you start to see things or you have, if, if you have imaginary friends or any of these things, I mean, your, your parents are probably going to be like, no, you need to shut, you know, turn that off or, you know, in other words, our intuition isn't something that 
is um, is encouraged, and then uh, then like and, and, and it can turn off just as easily easily as it can turn off. So you know you turn it off because you think you know people are going to think I'm crazy or whatever, and 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 again then you lose that ability to trust in yourself, and then that's where everything just and then you can become um, I don't like to say victim, but you can be so much more easily manipulated by what's going on out there. It's so important, isn't it? I think I heard, um, Bryce, I think you, it was one of the interviews you did with Jean-Claude, where we were also talking about the freeze response. We've got mm -hmm. the flight, the fight, and the freeze response. And I think what, um, just what you were just saying then, Cindy, as well, is a lot of people they're not only looking outside of themselves because actually you can see how society wise we've been taught that. So we've been taught very much to, if you can't academically explain something, then it must be wrong or it must be incorrect. They've taught us to ignore our feeling and our gut feeling. I mean, I feel really lucky because I've grown up surrounded by animals and I also work with animals and animals have not lost that at all. Now we might, and the humans in their life might try to suppress that like the humans often do um, to their own children. So in the British culture, you know, there's this real thing, or there used to be, it's probably not so much anymore, but a real thing about politeness. And so you're taught from a very early age, not to say what you really think, but to say the polite version of it. And of course, all of those are teaching very young children um, that you have to conform with what they see as the norm and you can't actually express yourself. And that's very, very dangerous because then you, you know, you, you see it all the time, a child handed round and there's certain people's laps they do not want to sit on. They do not want certain people to hold them. Right. You can see it with dogs and cats, with horses, you know, they're very sensitive to energy fields. And it doesn't always mean that there's an evil energy field or something. Sometimes it just could be that that person is dealing with so much themselves that they've got an energetic barrier around them. So it doesn't automatically mean if your dog won't go to someone that they're something awful. It can be all sorts of reasons for it. But I do see a lot this freeze response at the moment in people. Well, have you noticed that as well? well? It's funny you talked about politeness. That's a big, and I, you know, I think we talked about this here in America you can see different cultural pockets in our, in our country from where there were heavy European settlements. And Georgia, which was named after King George, Mad King George III, the one we, we won our independence from for a very short while, we, then we lost it. Most Americans don't know that. Then we lost it again in the 1800s. But uh, um, this whole area is of, of predominantly English descent. And so politeness, that kind of, that kind of, that's still very much a part of the Southern culture, isn't it, Cindy? Oh my kids gosh. Say, oh yes. Bless your heart. Bless yeah. And, <laughs> and as a child, like if we didn't say yes, ma'am, no, sir, like like it was like if my my parents, you know, you don't speak unless an adult speaks to you, and then you look that adult in the eye and you say yes, ma'am, and no, sir. Like it was very much. So I think we get that from Mother England. I think that's probably a cultural thing that was passed down from the settlers here because wasn't that long ago that that we separated so um so i get that i very much so and i think i think you know there's there's definitely a huge difference between teaching a child to be a respectful person but then also putting them molding them to be indoctrinated into something that you know we, we talk about mind control too you said something about manipulation and i was like that's it it's all manipulation um, and it is feeding on on vulnerability and fear. And a child is always vulnerable. Like kids come out, and we've talked about this kid, be, uh, Cindy, with um, trauma responses from your childhood, where you come out, your child, you're you're happy, you're happy, but you just get kind of beaten down in different ways, and it causes these like trauma responses, which then gives you a wound, an internal wound, which then makes you susceptible to certain types of um, manipulation and vulnerabilities yeah. that you might not have been susceptible to if you were just left alone but it happens to all of us so we're all in a position where we could be victim or vulnerable to some uh, sort of delusional uh, manipulation of reality if that makes sense yeah and we also have an instinct i mean it's just a primal human instinct and it's all built on survival to feel safe yeah and if you want to manipulate someone hit that you know if you hit someone's primal desire to feel feel safe and to feel secure, take that away from them 
and you'll you'll knock down the foundation because that is the foundational system in your in your energy center too right it's your root your root chakra which is all based off of that and the reason it's the foundational one is because of the importance you know from our ancestors back you know back way way back in the day when they were you know living off the land uh the survival instinct and also not just the desire to feel safe but the desire to belong because we're we're a tribal people we're not really meant to be going at life alone we're a tribal people and that was developed from you know way 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 a long time ago because if you were solo most likely you would probably die i mean you would literally die the elements would take you something an animal who knows you know something would take you out and so this this need for safety and uh the need to fit in which feeds into that thing that you're talking about conforming Mm -hmm. uh, because we don't like, you know, in general, that that sense of not fitting into something is really uncomfortable. But that's a human thing. That's a that's a human element that's built into us to keep us as a tribal unit. And uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, you know, you you take away and, and especially with a child, um, their instincts are they, they don't know why their instincts are there, but their instincts are strong. And the, and the second they get punished or they feel like they're getting pushed out of their, their tribe, you know, they're, they're not being accepted by their mother or their father or something like that. That feels very, very, very dangerous to that child. And so of course they're going to conform. And of course they're going to say, you know, do what they tell you to do. Uh, Cause uh, that's like the biggest fear, you know, abandonment. That's why abandonment is such, such a big fear within people as well. So hit upon people's fear you know, take away the sense of security, take away safe, safety, take away a sense of belonging, take away the tribe. And, and that makes you very vulnerable because it just shuts down. It shuts down. It literally, when the fight, flight, free, freeze response comes on, your, your sympathetic nervous system uh, turns on, all your rational stuff turns off. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Absolutely. And it made me laugh, actually, because it just shows I spend more time with animals and humans because I was going to say we're a herd animal, but the same thing, herd mm -hmm. tribal animal. And that, you know, when you have those rules, there's certain things that you have to do to um, fit in. Now, in, in an animal's herd, say in a, a herd of predator, uh, prey animals, when there's something wrong with them physically, their pheromones that they give off will change, which means they're detected that the rest of the herd can feel them. And that's why often an injured or a sick animal is often ostracized and shunned out of the herd or the pack, if you're talking about prey animals, because they're putting, by having those pheromone changes, you're sending warning signals out into the whole environment that will attract predators because you're showing that you're vulnerable. And I think that even though as humans, because we're sort of unique, really, in the animal kingdom, that we've got speech as our dominant scent, uh, way of communicating, which no other species have, we're missing out on those signs. So I think as a society, because we've been, um, the way that we have been taught to feed ourselves, the water, the food system, the air pollution, the EMF pollution, all of these things are leaving us vulnerable at a subconscious level and even though we might not be consciously aware of it at a subconscious level i think you know we know that people's stress levels are off the scale even before all this that the levels of chronic stress and that does have a huge effect on our cognitive ability doesn't it i was thinking about the adrenal glands that um i was listening to um for the job that Cindy and I do off the internet, I, I like listening to like movement teachers as well, just to hear their perspective on um, the human body. And I was listening to this talk about the adrenal glands and the way that our, that our society is structured now, especially in the Western world, where it's keeping up with the Joneses. I know we talked about this, Catherine, where there's all this stress and people are going into more and more and more debt and life is becoming more and more and more expensive. We're naturally going to have, our adrenal glands are naturally going to be upped. We're not, we're, they're not going to be, if we can get those in the guy, the teacher was saying, if you can get those to kind of relax, then everything in life is going to become easier. You're going to think clearer. You're going to be able to do the most mundane things without feeling tired, without feeling exhausted. You know, we have this whole, like it started off in Latin as carpe diem. Now the young kids say YOLO, 
was it you only live once or something? I, I grew up with carpe diem, but, um, but you know, then now we have FOMO fear of missing out, you know, and it's so this, this in, in, energy is like, even with the young kids, it's like starting to bubble up and it's like, it's, it's never, it's always about external. Like, like I said, you know, it's always about finding the external and not the internal, um, where if it, and I, I think, you know, like, again, we're all, we're all susceptible, but I feel like when you do take on like a yoga class, a yoga practice or like horseback riding, I heard people that go through like therapy with equestrians. It does naturally start to bring you back into your body where you do start to notice these patterns, even within yourself, when you start to notice your vulnerability slipping. And it's interesting. You said that about the animals, Catherine, because there's this thing we have in uh, Ashtanga yoga with like Mysore programs, the same, the same students come six days a week. So they all get to know each other, but it's interesting because it, it's true in all the shalas across the world. This is known. If a student in the program like gets a bum knee, let's say like somehow all of a sudden has a knee issue, then all of a sudden five other people will have a knee issue. If yeah. someone hurts their wrist, all of a sudden five other people will have a hurt wrist. It's the weirdest phenomenon, but it goes to show you how can how we release these these energies out that we're not even aware of because speech is our dominant communication because we're not even aware of the other ways in which we are communicating with each other. Um, you see it with women, women get on, you know, they're around each other a lot. They get on the same cycle. You know, it's funny in our yoga shala, cause my boyfriend is, he leads the program and he pretty much knows every woman's cycle because they all get it together because we don't practice on our cycles. And all of a sudden he just has a room full of men. (laughs) So, so, um, you know, and so it is, it is very interesting that when you just said about the animals, I was like, yeah. And we, as human beings, we have that as well, but we just don't pay attention to it. But if the animals know it, we should also know that as, and be honoring that as well, because we are a part of this ecosystem, you know, and we are a part of the animal kingdom. So I wonder if the animals would be, and it's funny, you're talking about the fear of manipulation. I was like, that sounds real. And that, you know, and I know like part of my control too is repetitive when you repeat things over and over and over again. And I know when I was a little girl, at least here in the United States, and I know Cindy, you probably also remember this, the news only came on, like we had the news in the morning. It was like, good morning, America, or the today show, like four hours in the morning. And then there would be like an hour of news at night. Yeah. That was it. That was it. All right. Now it cycles all day, all day, all day, all day, all day. And so it just feeds on itself. And so that fear feeds on itself, that vulnerability feeds on itself. And all of a sudden people are out there doing things without even researching because mm-hmm. that fear, they want to, they want to be, and they want to be able to go places and be with, I mean, that's their certain, not here in Georgia, but in certain places you, you have to follow the rules in order to go and be with society. So they are playing on that fear, aren't they? It's, it's pretty obvious. Mm. Well, yeah, that's one thing about uh, hypnotherapy. Um, and, and, you know, there's obviously lots of good hypnotherapists out there doing good work, you know, helping people. But the gist of the, the hypnotherapy is, yeah, sometimes there's, uh, you know, the, the typical pendulum <laughs> where your eyes are tracking, you're tracking something, or you're tracking your breath, or, or, or there's something you're counting to help people get deeper into their subconscious place because the subconscious is where you can go in and reprogram. Mm -hmm. But your conscious mind, again, it has a, it it has a purpose. You know, your conscious mind is what everything has to filter through there. So the thing with the work of the hypnotherapist is to try to bypass the conscious mind so that you can get into the subconscious mind and, and reprogram. So if you got some negative habits going on and stuff, you know, go in and shift it. But then uh, you can also, like if someone who uh, is, is more nefarious or is, is being manipulative, they can use that same kind of idea, bypassing someone's conscious mind. And again, you know, fear is a, is a good thing to do that because as you said, it, or as we've been talking about, it, it takes down your cognitive ability. It takes down your ability to rationalize and you get into the realm of the subconscious and the emotions. And mm-hmm. that's where you can go in and start to, you can, either, you can either really help somebody or you can really screw somebody up too. It's a really good point because all these tools can be used, uh, you know, for good or bad. I mean, I'm a big fan of Joe Dispenza, and I think he explains yes. it beautifully about how when you get trapped in the same cycle of emotions, 
then your destiny becomes self-fulfilled and you've got to become aware of things first. And I think one of the challenges I wanted to ask you both about is we're having this conversation. So Bryce and I talked when we spoke last time, we said we're very well aware that the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. So I'm very well aware that I there's masses of stuff I don't know. And we're like little children. We want to know. We want to know why, why, why. We want to ask those questions. But it's a bit like any form of addiction, isn't it? If the person isn't cognitively aware that they've got this issue, they're not even going to start employing some of the tools to open their mind up a bit. Is that, I mean, that's what I see happening with a lot of people around me because I, I've got, you know, friends that I'm a scientist, a lot of my friends are scientists and um, they will not even have the discussion. They will, will not even go there to have a discussion. It's so strongly shut down. It's just, it's just fascinating. I think that's where our educational system is too, because now, and I, I remember growing up and I know you ladies probably remember this. We had the Dewey decimal system where we yeah. had to go to the library and find a book and, and research all these books. And so there was more, more of like a wiggle room as far as like ideas. And it wasn't just a quick Google search, you know, and I always laugh and I tell my friends, kids that, that their parents and I had to like earn our knowledge. Like it was like a scavenger hunt to find your knowledge. It wasn't just easy access on the internet. Um, and of course, when you're, you know, I come from a family of, of medical doctors as well. And my, my dad is, is a, a vet. And th I think they just get, you know, I think that there's a lot of, which you should be proud of yourself. Like if you accomplish something like that, and you should always be proud of your accomplishments. You know, if you're, if you finished medical school, like that takes a special person to be able to do that or law school. But I think so many people, of course, as Cindy was saying, you get caught up into wanting to fit in, wanting to be like accepted by the professors. You, you need to qualify for all these different courses and, you know, to take the, the MCATs and to get it, you know, there's all these different. And then all of a sudden when you're thrust in situations what, like we are, it's like your whole life you have been dang the carrots been dangled in front of you to achieve this certain thing by following this particular path without any outside resources actually going, well, wait a minute, but what about this? But what about this? But, and of course, then you also get money involved. I think money's a big motivator. We know that a lot of, um, what's that thing going around right now? I don't know if, if I can really say this on YouTube, but like a hundred percent of uh, scientists will, will agree with the person. Them. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so, it, but then the little man, like, like we know that in our medical institutions, I would guess to say that like 90% of the people across the world in these institutions are there to do good. They have the intention of doing good, but they have been convinced that to do good, they have to fall, do X, Y, and Z and follow this path. You know, we're seeing that a lot now with, with, um, with a lot of, of uh, here in America, we have a lot of medical people who are walk, walking off the job because they're all of a sudden being choice to make a decision that, 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 and now we, we have to be careful what we say on YouTube about that. But, um, but yeah, I think it's just this, uh, and I think people do at some point, like you were saying, Catherine, where when you don't know that you don't know something, then you don't know, you don't know something, but at some point it's like, I know in yoga sometimes, especially with the Patanjali system, it's like suffering is necessary for you to have an, a realization. There has to be almost like we, as we say in the South, a come to Jesus moment. you have to have your come to Jesus moment sit, take it up with, sit down with the Lord for a minute. <laughs> um, and I think that, that, um, and, yeah, and Patanjali was talking about that 5,000 years ago. Like you have to go through a sense of suffering, true suffering to almost understand what you don't understand. And therefore you can surrender as my boyfriend says, you can kind of settle into that a little bit and be okay with the unknown because you are grounded within yourself, if that makes sense. But a lot of people, especially in the Western world, haven't had a chance to even experience that because we're going so fast and our world is so yeah. comfortable and, you know, it's like a rat race and, you know. I would say too that um, identity, identity, uh, it's like that's a, a big important component of the ego. And it, if you start to challenge someone's uh, if, uh, belief system and if that belief system is strongly, strongly tied to their identity and who they are, they're going to resist that light. I mean, they're going to give you a tremendous amount of resistance because then if you take away someone's identity, 
then what's left? And that's the scary part of the yoga practice too, or any practice, not, not just yoga, but any practice that, that starts to delve you in, it, it makes you look at all these different identities that you're strongly, strongly attached to. And it encourages you to detach from these identities because they could fall apart in just a moment anyways, because the identities are, all, uh, you know, just very often formulated by uh, what you've experienced through life, certain responses that have helped you. And, um, and it's what gives a sense of form and structure to some people too. And when you start to dissolve people's identities, that's, a, that's just a scary feeling. <laughs> if, if you've ever gone through an ego death, we've talked about that too, Bryce. If you go through an ego death, it's painful because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's really scary to, to be in that unknown space. Okay, so, so you're taking away all my ego, all my identity, what's left? Yeah. And that ego death, I mean, it truly feels like a death. And I just think that a lot of people aren't willing to go there. You know right. what I mean? So if they have a strong identity toward, toward their work or, or what they're doing, and then something challenges that, they're going to fight that. They're going to fight that because they don't, that, that ego death is, it's not, you know, it's not a fun process to always go through. So I think you have that resistance as well when people yeah. are challenged in their beliefs. It's funny you say that because I don't know, Catherine, if you're familiar with um, the IBLP here in the United States, um, part of what I've been doing with David Zublick is looking into like high controlled um, religious groups, especially coming from like Protestants. We talk a lot about the Catholic Church, but we're diving into these Protestant here in, um, in America. We have a lot. I mean, we, a lot of people who are Protestant Christian are very open minded, grounded people. But we have these groups like the IBLP. Um, which are the Institute of Basic Life Principles that are just very extreme in their beliefs. And it's interesting you say that because there was a television show here a few years back called 19 Kids and Counting. And these people oh follow gosh. this um, qu quiverful lifestyle where they don't use birth control and they just have like gazillion children. And the women wear almost like not prairie dresses like you see in the Mormon faith, but walk, like they don't show their, and the women are taught, they grow their hair long. They're taught to be like super submissive to the husband, that the woman is just kind of incidental, that the husband is her path to God. It's all based on like Christian texts, but it's not, in my opinion, it's, it's a very toxic belief system. Well, anyway, there was a show here in America called 19 Kids Accounting, which followed this family called the Duggar family, who followed these Institute and Basic Life Principal, the very independent Baptist, um, Quiver, they had 19 kids. Um, and their oldest son, they marry them, they, they do courting where they don't date, they're just kind of put with the person at like 18 years old, they, they get married very young, have children. And the oldest son had gotten in trouble in the past. Some things had come out about him, him being on Ashley Madison, which was a website where you can have an affair. Um, and his wife, you know, she has like seven kids now with him. And he just got arrested a few months ago. And I'll be careful how I say this. Um, and if you guys aren't sure what I'm talking about, you can just Google the name Josh Duggar and it will show you. Um, he had a CP on his computer. Nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. If y'all know what child start P. Anyway, so they arrested him. He's in his early 30s. And his wife, because of the, the mind control, the brainwashing, because that's her identity, they keep them isolated away from the world, has stuck stuck by his side and is basically saying he's been set up. Like this is all, a, you know, she's basically, comp her children have to be forensically looked at now to see if they've been hurt. Um, they took pictures of his hands because apparently there was a scar on his hand that was apparent in one of the allegedly in one of the pictures he had on his computer, which means he wasn't just holding this stuff, but was actively participating in it. Children as young as like five. So just nasty, just totally uh, just awful. Uh, I love how Jenny says dastardly, just, just, mm -hmm. da just nefarious. But this, well, I was watching this documentary this uh, weekend, um, actually right before class started on Sunday, Cindy, I was sitting at the desk on my phone watching it. <laughs> there was about how brainwashed the mm -hmm. wife is. And how people here in America who aren't even a part of this organization are trying to like get her to leave. But you're right, that whole identity, even if you look at something as extreme, as extreme as like that situation, you can see mirror reflections in even that extreme situation in your own life and in just the average uh, secular world where people are totally locked in on who they're supposed to be, who they've been taught to be. And we know in yoga, we're taught that that's, that's not even real anyway. 
So then, yeah, who are you at that point? I mean, um, Sri Swami Satchitananda does a great commentary about that. Like the mind's perception of itself is simply that just a perception. It's not necessarily real. And when you start telling people that, like, first of all, who you are, isn't real. But second of all, your whole life you've identified as this. And that's not even real. I mean, we see it in politics too over here. How many people vote Democrat or Republican simply because that's who they're supposed to be when they even ha if they haven't even taken a moment to actually look at the platform, you know, but they, they've identified with that label. And so they don't want to challenge that. They don't want to rock that boat, you know, it's mm -hmm. or Catholic or Protestant, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's so true. That's, I think that, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head where it comes down to where this all starts. It's the identity you've been given where a child, if you look at a small child, they don't care what people are. No, not really? at all. Yeah. Animals don't I'm care. No judgment about what you're wearing, what car you're in, your what job. You're like or anything they just know whether you like them or not and and do you think also it comes into it that um in terms we've talked a lot about connection to nature and and it, whether it's yoga whether it's meditation whether it's getting out in nature whatever way it is for connecting with the real energy of the earth and getting out of the matrix so to speak but i think the way again i'm talking more in the western world here at the moment that, that we've been programmed to live where both parents are out at work, if there are two parents around anyway, that you haven't got a chance, the education system is crammed so full that there's no opportunity for a child to ask or any discussions, it's sit down and learn and that's it. Most people haven't got time to cook properly, so they're living off processed food, contaminated water, so energetically their vibration and their energy levels are so low they haven't got the the capacity, the energy within themselves to start questioning these things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so sad. And you have to, uh, um, you know, I think they're, they're and, uh, just one thing too that you, you were saying about nature, uh, nature has also through, through this process to a certain degree, it, it's like we even put a war in a way against nature when you think about how, you know, cut down all the trees or if even if you look at uh, movies, when you go into a forest, oh, the forest is evil. You know, yeah. that's where all the bad things are going to happen to you. So it's almost like this narrative has also made nature an enemy. And but nature is what we, I mean, we're made up of, of nature. We're made up of earth and fire and wind and water. And that's how we, we move through the world. And that's where a lot of our, our intuition comes from as well. And mm -hmm. you take away that, that connection with that, the, our natural source. And yes, and, and, and uh, feeding foods that are not even like real food. Yeah. Well, you know, because you know, real food comes from nature and you get that essence of the energy that, that comes in and it nourishes you. And so you give food that's not even connected to nature, really, like all of this natural component has been taken away from it. Uh, that disconnect that that's been happening from, from the forces of nature. Yes, I mean, I strongly believe that that makes you a lot more vulnerable and, and weak. And, uh, and then just, I mean, what, what pulls you out of that? I don't know. They're just, at some point, there just must be a soul and natural desire uh, and knowing that there's something more. Yeah. And I think maybe that's just what, that's what, that, you know, is a big component, I think, as to what's going to awaken people versus what's going to keep people asleep. Do they have that thing inside of them that says, wait a minute, you know, there's, there's got to be something more than this, something bigger, something better, something that, I've been missing out along and then you start, then you start your search, you know, you start, start looking elsewhere and, and seeing how, uh, how we have been kind of put into this weird little crazy box in a way. You know what I was thinking when you said that, Cindy, I was thinking about how we call it the midlife crisis, you know, where people hit about my age and they start to like panic because they realize there's more to life. And what do people say? Oh, mm -hmm. that's just a midlife crisis. You'll snap out of it. You know, right. they, yeah. just, uh -huh. they just that like, oh, you're just you're just having. And then they started they started something when I was in my 20s called the quarter life crisis where 25, 20, we went out 27 is your Saturn return, because that's all that's when you kind of go through a little come to Jesus moment. 
sorry, my dogs, he, he always thinks everyone's here just to play with him. <laughs> so um, yeah, sorry if you guys can hear him barking, but, um, but yeah, so every time we hit those, those times in our life where all of a sudden we go, oh my God, who am I really? The world tells us, oh, you're just going through a phase. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Here, eat, mm-hmm. or, you know, processed food. And, and, you know, one thing that I, the rabbit, one of the rabbit holes that I've been going down, and I haven't presented any of this on my channel yet because I'm still trying to figure it out, is even like our, our relationship to the sun. You know, when I was a little kid growing up here in the South where it's very, very hot, we would go and spend the summer at, with my mom's family on the low country, the, the coast of South Carolina. We would be kind of kicked out all day and we just play outside all day on the beach. And um, we, they never, we never put sunscreen on ever, exactly. like, ever. And all of a sudden now it's like people are loaded on sunscreen. And I've been, you know, we see that, that Mr. Bill, I won't say his last name. Um, and they want to like, they wanted to do something to like close put something over mm. us like a literal that would kind of stop and they were selling it to people like this was a good idea but they had already oh started God. that with the sunscreen and i'm not don't take this as advice guys this is something that i'm just looking into myself that that the solution that they've given us might actually be the cause of these issues that we're having with our skin because we actually need the sun we need Absolutely. we need that and so they've even tried to disconnect us from that that solar literal solar power which matches into the solar power the solar plexus that's what they're called solar plexus of the body you know so if you even start to think about that and allow yourself to just be in the sun and and to see how it kind of changes your connection to what the world is telling you you, you know if that makes sense and, and i agree with the eating when i actually really focus on eating like plant-based i feel better i feel calmer I feel more grounded within myself. It's like you're supporting not just your body, but you're also supporting your spirit to understand its, its own value, you know, which again, succumbing to the, to the mind control is, is you undervaluing valuing yourself really too, you know, because you want to follow, follow the crowd. So Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Oh yeah. I mean, pulling away any connection with it. Yeah. The sun, I mean, the sun, that's why so many cultures were sun worshipers. Mm-hmm. I mean, the sun it is, it is what gives us life on this planet and we couldn't live at all without the sun. And we need the sun even just to like vitamins, vitamin D. Mm-hmm. And, it, exactly. and you know, there's a lot of people when, when the sun goes away and it's very cloudy outside, they actually get depressed. Mm-hmm. So the sun affects right down to the core of your mood. We're very much connected with the sun Uh, and with all, I mean, with all of it, with all the planets, the sun, the moon, with all the planetary forces, honestly, with with Mars, with Jupiter, with Mercury, they all affect us in a certain way. But we've been disconnected from that. I mean, when when you start talking about the planetary influences and DTs and how, you know, how that affects us, even some people will look at you and go like, "Uh, I think you're a little, you're a little cray cray in here, get (laughs) into all that stuff. (laughs) <laughs> but that, you know, but that those connections are what feed us and give us power, mm-hmm. you know, and it, and, it, and it gives us that that sense of knowing that, wow, the whole natural world is supporting me right now. And when you have that feeling of the natural world being here and that you're just a part of it, I mean, that gives you a sense of like being able to settle and to feel safe, you know, to feel that's something that um, if you feel that, um, and, and someone tries to take it away, I mean, that just, let's just say, don't let people take that away from you. I guess that's, right. that's what I'm trying to say. No one has the right to take that, to take that away from you. And we, we all is, have that connection. I think a lot of people like quote unquote woke up or quote unquote, what's that a there's a great meme that goes around that says you don't you don't you know like like um um when they when they shut us up you know when they they locked us in I think a lot of people started to all of a sudden feel a change in their physical being and that's what started them going wait a minute wait a minute and then Cindy and I are lucky because we're not in a, we're in Georgia so it's a little bit we're a little bit more freer here but um but i think a lot because that was take was taken away from them so drastically because a lot of uh high controlled situations the way that they they implement their mind control is slowly over time you know you look at like the typical love bombing and then it gets you isolated but but when they Mm -hmm. do it like 
all of a sudden it's when there's almost that reaction of what have you taken from me? Like there is something that's being taken from me. And I think that's why a lot of people started shifting, but with the identity thing, with the whole science thing and the identity thing, um, you guys know what I'm talking about. It did cause this divide because some people were like, I'm going to go over here because I know something different is happening where the people over here were clinging to that label of what they had been taught their whole life repetitively was good. And that was follow the experts, you know, do this, do that, do that, do this, you know? And so, but it, it was clinging to that identity. So you are seeing in these two different camps of people, a different sort of um, mind perception, which, you know, as you were saying in the beginning, Catherine, like, is either i don't think either one are totally right but either it's it's just it's just a very interesting interesting phenomenon that we're getting to witness right now and that's one thing about uh ram Doss's teaching i know uh, Cindy and i've talked about ram Doss a lot and he always Catherine, sometimes you say things that remind me of how ram Doss was perception but he's not with us anymore but how he perceived things mm -hmm. because instead of getting emotional about situations he would just sit back and kind of you know sit back and talk about observing something and just being like this is interesting instead of getting so emotionally tied up with one side or the other, even though you tended to lean towards one side, which we know we lean towards one side, but you can still have the wherewithal to sit back and detach from both and see this is very interesting, uh, the phenomenon that's happening. You know, because both people on this camp and this camp are getting pretty much the same information, are experiencing the same thing, but seem to be living in two totally different realities right now at the moment, two yeah. totally, you know? So it's, and I think it's really the more you, you know, I, I take it back to sort of nature game because the way a lot of people have chosen to live their lives, um, they are so disconnected from nature and, and nature, take it any spiritual practice, taking it, getting out of the, the matrix, so to speak, because most people, unfortunately, like you said very early on in the conversation prize, is unfortunately one of the things about human nature is most people need a real shock to the system to make a big change in their lives because it does take effort. It does take effort to change habits. And there's so much work that people have done on this to show, you know, how much sort of repetitive things it takes to, to change a habit. And when you've been caught in that trap and, you know, you're living – in a city environment, you're, you've got a stressful job, you've got very little leisure time, etc. You you haven't really had time to get out and, and think about it. And then, of course, when they lock people down, there was huge stress initially about what they're going to do for money, caring for loved ones that they might not be able to access, all these other stresses putting on people. Um it brings out different reactions. And I am sort of thinking, <laughs> if, we want, if we've got friends and family members we want to wake up, perhaps we should not say anything to them, take them out for a really long hike. <laughs> and then when we sit down and feed them, start to raise the things. Because <laughs> what's blatantly obvious to me, I'm talking about myself, but most of the people that I've spoken to are having similar situations, is the approach, there's lots of talk in the truth community, which I absolutely hate, but there's lots of talk about they're waiting for a critical mass to wake up. But if you keep doing the same thing, they're not going to wake up. Yeah. So we have to, at an individual level, at a collective level, start changing our approach somehow. Because if we keep banging our head against the same wall, I don't see anything changing. I don't see enough changing. I see the more people that they think they're aware of what's going on. And I do agree with you, Bryce. There's so many off the scales. I mean, there's lots of truthers. That I think, well, no, that's too much for me sort of thing, or perhaps a scale or exaggerated in my opinion from what I've seen. But I just think we've got to think of some different techniques to open them up and then keep employing them ourselves as well to see what else are we missing? Because we must be missing a trick. Otherwise it wouldn't be taking so long. <laughs> you know. I think one thing you said too, uh, when, when you said people are waiting for a critical, it's like as an individual person, I mean, you can't wait for anybody yeah. or anything to do anything. You, you do it now. It's like you, you do it now. And what, um, and I'm not as in the, the, the truth community or the truther community as, as both of you are, but, you know, sometimes I do see things like, 
oh, well, I can't wait till this happen, or yeah. when's the date for this to happen, or when is this going to happen? I'm like, no, you don't wait for anything to happen. You right. start to do the work right now and don't wait for something or for some, for some big phenomenon to happen to save you because that's, again, looking for your salvation outside of you. And that's also feeding into another narrative. Right. It's like, is that narrative better than the one that you're trying to get out of? Yep. You know what I mean? So it's like, quit waiting for that date or for this or for that person to come in and to do this thing and to save you. Forget that. And like... You have to start with your work. At least this is what I believe. You know, your work, quit waiting, do it now. And if each person would take that responsibility, the world would shift yeah. in an instant. Absolutely. I, and I agree 100% with you. It's it's interesting. Like, like Catherine and I both put our videos up every day and like, you know, talk about all these kinds of things going on and present different topics to the audience to have a, a conversation and start talking about things. But I think if people saw us in our day to day lives, they would see a difference in what we present on YouTube. It's not saying we're different people, but you know, when we're on YouTube presenting these topics, it's we're doing it for a reason to start a conversation. But in our day to day lives, I, you know, it's funny. Last time Catherine and I spoke, what was it yesterday, day before yesterday? Um, we, um, we were saying how we were feeling anxious, you know, we we're filming, but it's interesting. You were saying that because I know from, from my yoga practice that every time I start to feel anxious and whether that's something influencing me from the outside or the inside, whatever it is, I will take a moment to like sit down and breathe or even just turn music on and listen for a minute and just even, even, and sometimes I, I, again, I was having a conversation with two of my girlfriends last night about this with some of the people in the truth or community that may have gone off the deep, deep end a little bit. And it's like, again, yes, that is, that is an, an, they, their ego has clinged to this illusion mm. that makes them more valuable as a person and puts them on the scale of being better than because they're connected to the story that they've told themselves. And yes, I do believe there are people who are alive that we don't have been told are not alive, all that kind of stuff. But as far as like some, some of the, you know, and I've said this before to people a lot about um, other, you know, speaking of that with certain figures out there that, that I've, I work with that might be somebody and we're not sure yet. And I said to somebody once, I was like, you know, at this point, I don't really even care who that person really is because I like the person who I talk to, you know, exactly. the, the, the story's gone now. Like I, I like that person, whoever this person is, I have a relationship with this, that person now off camera too. And I like this guy a lot. He's funny. He makes me laugh. He's smart. So whether he is this famous person or not in real life, I think a lot of people know who we're talking about. He has a mm -hmm. number name. Um, Cindy, if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'll tell you afterwards. Um, I don't know who you're talking about. Okay. It, doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't matter to me um, if he is who they think he is or if he isn't. It doesn't matter to me at this point. I like the person who I'm talking to. And I think, I think a lot of truthers out there, though, they are attached to the story. And so again, it's feeding that ego, that label of identity. So it's, they are literally in the same boat as the people they criticize mm -hmm. who are following the yeah. label on the other side. You're supposed mm -hmm. to following a, a, an illusion. You know, you're chasing the dragon, so to speak, just in it's a different just like there's, It's like there's this coin, though, the vision I always see is like there's a coin and it's kind of like this nefarious, corrupt coin. coin. You know, one side is, is one belief and the other side is just another belief. Like, you know, one, the one flip of the coin is one and the other flip, but it's this exact same coin. Yeah. And I, so it's like, like no, but let, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you, Cindy. No, that's okay. Well, Go right ahead. I just think this is what got us into trouble a lot to begin with, because there was all this talk about calling people sheeple, which first of all, I thought was very insulting to sheep, because um, <laughs> I love sheep. But <laughs> Um, and she behave how she should behave. It's the humans that abuse that. Mm -hmm. um, in the world, they're fine until we start taking advantage of their lovely character. But because when you insult people and you get completely attached to your belief, then you are behaving an exact reflection of the people that you're criticizing. And going back to what you just said then, Grace, I think what, what all three of us do, and we're not pretending we're perfect in any shape or form, well, I'm certainly not, but what we do is we live our daily lives and enjoy our daily lives. And every day, you know, we're doing our thing. You know, yours is we've all got our different practices that we follow. Um, 
because we're constantly looking at ourselves and examining ourselves and you know i've got the best reflection in the world because if i go out and see my horses and i'm not in a good state they're going to bugger off they don't want to spend time with me you know they've got <laughs> toys to come or go and on frequently occasions you know i think i said to you once Bryce, one of my horses romeo is the funniest ever because he does not take any nonsense from me so if i'm with him and then I'm listening to something on my phone or talking to someone on the phone. He's off. He's like, you are so rude. You know? <laughs> He's like giving you the middle finger and walking off. And, and it, <laughs> it, it's comical because then I have to, so if anyone could hear me having the conversation, oh, I'm sorry, Romeo. Yes, that was rude like this. And then I have to literally put down, apologize. And then he comes up to me. And it's a really good reminder of the stories we tell ourselves and when we're not sort of, you know, actually practicing what we preach and I think with everyone who's out there on whatever side of the fence you are if we're getting certain reactions off people we've got to look at what we're presenting and the way we're presenting it yeah that's you know, exactly I, it yes I've been doing that uh, recently in the grocery store and then again again where Cindy and I live especially closer to where Cindy is not everyone it's not that extreme here, right? Like you go to the grocery store, you, you don't have to worry about being, but I don't wear mine in the grocery store. I go, you know, I just go without it on. And at first I would like try not to make eye contact with people, just go and do my thing and then leave again. And then I was like, you know what? No, that's, that's silly because I'm acting like an a-hole, just like some of these other people I think act like a-holes. Like that's silly, you know? And so I was like, they're not going to say anything to me. It's not mandated. Like they're not, no, none of the employees care. They're not going to say anything. And so every time I go to the grocery store now, I intentionally try to make eye contact with every person I pass an aisle, regardless of whether they're this or not and smile at them. And just, mm -hmm. and, and I've noticed that if you just smile at someone, it just, it disarms their, their walls. They have their walls up too. And it, it and regardless of whether they have this one or not, you can see it in their eyes. If they have this one, they, they smile back at you, you know? So you, do you can't, you, can, you can't, you know, and I know, Cindy, I think we've talked about this before about like projection. When you, the, the nastiness you notice in somebody else is typically the nastiness that's within you as well. Now, yeah. Cindy, you said something beautiful. The, the beauty you notice in somebody else is typically the beauty that's within you as well. And so when, when we're on this side of, of the coin and we're pointing across the, the aisle at the people that we don't consider to be awake, that can't see what's going on, and we're nasty about them, then we're being no better than they are. Yeah. You know, and so... And I think that's how we make the difference, too, Catherine. You're, you're asking, like, how, what, what can we do different? I think it's exactly what Bryce was saying. You, you do your work. And you show up, and yeah, so we're all going to have nasty, bad days, PMSing, who, whatever, you know, things are just going to happen. You're not always going to be in a great mood, but, you know, trying to do as much work as you can so that when you show up to the people around you and, and smile instead of snarling, that's, I think that's how different, how, that's how at a grassroots effort, that's how things will shift and, and become different. Yeah, we make a, a difference individually, and in, and then the way we we uh, we're in relationship with other people comes straight back to you know the good old saying: "Be the change you want to see in the world." Mm -hmm. it all starts with us, and and when we're doing the work on ourselves, and when we're learning, and we're taking feedback, and we're keeping an open mind, and listening to other people's point of view. I do think it would be so much easier if we still had tails. I've always wanted a tail. And I've got, I've got one I wear sometimes, but you know, you could, you can't, a cat can't be unauthentic. You can see how they're feeling by their tail. Yes. <laughs> I think it would make life a lot easier for us humans. Perhaps that should be a, uh, even for their ears, their yes. ears are pinned back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really yeah. is. I think we should, we should start a new trend. Now. I've got three tails that I do wear. <laughs> I only stopped wearing one when I went out in the woods once on a dog walk wearing my fox's tail and this man I'd never met before came up and started stroking it. It was a bit of <laughs> so, so then I took it off. But no, I, I just think this is a fascinating conversation, ladies. I'd love to carry it on with you, Lauren, and sort of go into more next time of um, carry on on the solution side of things. And I can't wait to hear what people who are watching it, what they're finding is working for them. Because I said, I just have had this big sort of 
aha moment recently. It's just like, God, no wonder we're not chipping away because both sides are just at loggerheads and um, behaving in the same way, really, just on, as you said, Cindy, different sides of the coin. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll take, step, take a step further. If people watching my channel or well, Cindy or Catherine, if you have any points we missed and you want us to talk about Adam in the comments, comment yeah. section, or if you have questions about how to like maintain anything, I mean, it's not saying we're the experts, but we can talk about it on the show and, um, you know, and, and, uh, try to figure this out together. Yeah. Well, I we, think it's we, just we, conversations like this make a difference, you know, even if we're not the experts, having normal human conversation about it, that's where it, that's also where it starts. You know, that's where it begins. And trusting experts didn't get us that far anyway. So. <laughs> no, that's what I love. I mean, you know, you know, the expert is a reflection that you get back, isn't it? That's yeah. the, biggest, but the biggest feedback, really. You can think you know as much as you like, but right. <laughs> your life experiences teaches you otherwise or, or confirms that you are on the right track. Oh, it's just so lovely speaking to you about this, ladies. I can't wait to see everyone's comments and feedback. And like you said, Bryce, in terms of, you know, do you, do you like having these conversations? If you've got other things that you'd like to see people talking about and everything, because for me, I loved it. I really Thank loved you. it. Ladies. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and including me. Is one of my favorite. It's just, when, Catherine, when you come to America, you're going to have to come to, to our yoga, Cindy, our Cindy's yoga school on Sunday. Hey, it's yours. We, yeah. we will have a picnic after class. We'll lock the doors. <laughs> we will just. <laughs> Talk about all absolutely. this stuff. <laughs> as long as I share my tail, I'm coming. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. Let's continue this on another chat. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.